This video concludes our tour of the Equal Protection Kickstarter. Remember, at this point, we've identified our inequality and we've decided what level of scrutiny to apply. So now it's time to apply the scrutiny. The basic idea behind any kind of judicial review is to decide if the government has a good enough reason for doing what it's doing. So the modern case law divides that inquiry into two separate questions. We have the ends, what goal the government is pursuing, and we have the means, the methods that the government uses to pursue those ends. When considering the ends or the goals of the law, we can ask what interest of the government is being served. The variety of government interests is potentially infinite, and there might be more than one interest served by any one law. For example, the food stamp program was intended to serve two interests. Now, the interest most people are familiar with is to give subsidized food to people who could not otherwise afford it. But the other interest involved agricultural supply and demand. When the government issues food stamps, it in effect drives up demand for food, which ensures that farmers can receive a good price for their crops. So this is why the food stamp program has always been administered by the Department of Agriculture rather than some other federal agency. Having identified some government interests, the level of scrutiny will affect how good that government interest needs to be to justify the inequality. Of course, under any level of scrutiny, a law whose governmental purpose boils down to simple animosity towards some disfavored group will never be a suitable goal. Now, most of the time, the government interest will be found suitable at whatever level of scrutiny we're dealing with or at least it'll be assumed to be suitable for purposes of argument. Courts then proceed to evaluate the means that are used to pursue these governmental interests. This is often known as tailoring, asking how good a fit exists between the law and the government interest. I sometimes find it useful to think of ends and means questions as involving why and how. At each level of scrutiny, we can ask whether the ends and the means are good enough to justify reliance on the classification that is being challenged. Now, there's some standard vocabulary that typically gets used to indicate the difference between the levels. At the rational basis level, the ends must be legitimate and the means must be reasonable. These terms are intended to convey a general attitude of deference to the legislature, as seen in Caroline products. The ends don't have to be extraordinarily important, just legitimate, as opposed to something illegitimate, like animosity against a disfavored group. The government's use of the challenged classification doesn't have to be a perfect method of pursuing the goal, just a method that is reasonable or rational in the sense of being not unreasonable or not irrational. Under strict scrutiny, the government needs a really good reason for relying on the challenge classification. The usual vocabulary is to require a government interest that is compelling and means that are narrowly tailored. These terms are intended to convey a general attitude of skepticism to the legislature, as seen in Skinner or Lubbock. The court is not going to accept sloppy justifications, and if the government's goals don't truly require relying on the challenge classification, then the government shouldn't rely on it. Please don't be misled by this terminology into thinking that the difference between strict scrutiny and rational basis review can be mathematically precise. There are too many variables at play in different cases to construct some perfect algorithm that will separate compelling interests from legitimate interests, or an algorithm that can decide exactly when reliance on a classification is reasonably related, but not narrowly tailored. With that said, there are some tools that often get used, especially on the tailoring side, to get a handle on how good or bad a law's tailoring is. One tool asks whether the law is over-inclusive or under-inclusive. The other tool asks whether there are less discriminatory alternatives. Under-inclusion and over-inclusion involve comparing the problem that the government identified, that will be part of its government interest, 
with the law that was chosen to deal with that problem. For example, in Caroline Products, the stated government interest was a belief that it was not healthy to substitute vegetable fat for milk fat. So even if we accept that as legitimate, banning filled milk was not banning all food that substituted vegetable fat for milk fat. Margarine, for example, wasn't banned. So Congress is not solving the entire problem, and that means the law was under-inclusive. An over-inclusive law regulates things that aren't part of the problem. So imagine Congress wanted to regulate products that substituted vegetable fat for milk fat. And it does this by banning all products that are sold in cans. Now this law will take care of the filled milk problem, but it also bans lots of other things sold in cans that aren't causing any alleged nutritional problem. It's quite possible for a law to be both over-inclusive and under-inclusive. The example from the previous slide actually has this pattern. By banning all foods sold in cans, Congress was under-inclusive because it didn't ban filled milk that was sold in bottles or sold in cartons. And Congress was being over-inclusive because it banned lots of healthy food that are sold in cans. In a perfect world, there wouldn't be very much under-inclusiveness or over-inclusiveness. However, even the best laws will typically have some amount of under-inclusiveness or over-inclusiveness. Think about the speed limit. We have speed limits on highways in the interest of traffic safety, but this is under-inclusive because some cars driving slower than the speed limit actually are dangerous, and it's over-inclusive because some cars driving a little bit faster than the speed limit are actually safe. For this reason, the Constitution tolerates imperfect tailoring in most laws. We don't want the Equal Protection Clause to be so demanding that it requires perfection in every single law. That simply isn't possible. But in some cases, the under-inclusion or over-inclusion is so noticeable to make the law unacceptable. Another way to think about tailoring considers alternatives. Imagine that we have a problem with a shortage of gasoline, and one way to deal with this would be to ration gasoline by sex. Men can buy gasoline on even-numbered days, and women can buy it on odd-numbered days. Now, this may solve the gas shortage problem, but it's relying on a sex classification. And that's objectionable, and it should be avoided if it's possible. So is it possible to solve the problem without relying on this particular classification? Yes, it is. The government could institute some kind of lottery system. So we think of that as a less discriminatory alternative. As I've described them so far, these tools are somewhat impressionistic, and that's true but they can help guide us towards some general patterns. If a classification is one that draws strict scrutiny, under-inclusiveness and over-inclusiveness are serious potential problems that could defeat a law. However, at the rational basis level, under-inclusiveness is almost never a problem. Think about the filled milk law in Caroline products. It left the margarine problem unsolved, and the court was not bothered by it. Similarly, it's very rare for over-inclusiveness to be a problem when we're at the rational basis level of review. Less discriminatory alternatives are generally seen as mandatory in strict scrutiny cases, but they're not required for rational basis cases. So this concludes our introductory tour of the equal protection methodology. Now, there are some elaborations on this structure and they can be important in certain types of cases. For example, intermediate scrutiny, and also the disparate impact theory of discrimination. But those are concepts that we can add on top to the basic structure that we've seen in these videos.